Our first lecture will be a population of slaves, pornography, the brain of addiction by Dr. Donald Hilton, who is an adjunct associate professor of neurosurgery at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio. He's also the director of spine fellowship and the director of neurosurgical training at the Methodist Hospital. His research and publishing interests have included traumatic brain injury, minimally invasive surgery, and neural mechanisms of addiction. He has authored peer-reviewed journal articles and book chapters on addiction. He also serves on the board of directors of the National Center on Sexual Exploitation and has served on the board for the Society of the Advancement of Sexual Health. Dr. Hilton has spoken at numerous symposium and forums on pornography as a public health issue in the United States and internationally, including at the Vatican Conference convened by Pope Francis in 2017 and has been featured in several documentaries on pornography. He and his wife, Jana, have five children and six grandchildren. I want to personally thank Dr. Hilton because he has been instrumental in arranging this conference. He's given me a lot of advice on this topic, which I know knew very little about. So thanks again, Dr. Hilton. Testing. Can you hear me okay? Is that on? Okay. Testing here. Okay, I have a, a mic on. Sometimes I'll walk a little bit. Is, it, is this on as well still? Okay. All right. What a delight it is to be with you today and to um, have this opportunity to be here. Thank you all for coming on this, uh, on this Saturday morning. And Al, thank you and everyone who has put so much work into arranging this, uh, this marvelous event. Uh, I'm heartened by so much interest in this subject. I think it's a subject that behooves us all to take seriously and to learn about. Um, because we're all people. We're all sons, daughters, husbands, wives, fiancés, friends, in-laws, and we all have them. And this problem, and I will use that word, it's a problem, and I'll use it unapologetically, is affecting every family. Some may not know that yet, but that's the nature of this beast. Let's see if I can make this, there we go. So today um, we have uh, about 45, 50, about 50 minutes. Um, and I'm gonna hold to that. Some of the slide, in doing so, some of the slides I'm not going to read fully in the interest of time, because I want to get through all of the, the topics that we'll talk about today. So some of them, I'll maybe point out a phrase or something, and then I'll point out where you can go look it up. And if you want to contact me afterwards, um, please feel free to do that. I'll be here throughout the day, give you my information. What I'd like to do is talk about it, pornography from several standpoints, and we'll kind of weave through these as we go. And sometimes I'll kind of go, it'll seem like off of whatever vein I'm on, and then it'll come back, but they're kind of interrelated. Is pornography or can pornography become addictive in a brain addictive kind of way? And I mean, cause you to have an addiction. Is it exploitive? Does it exploit vulnerability? People that don't have, in other words, do the powerful use the less powerful? either in its production or in its use. What about bias? To really talk about the science, which we will, and the state of the classifications of what we call it, which change with time, of course, is there bias? Is there bias for? Am I biased? Are you biased? Are those that say pornography is fine, are they biased? We will talk about that as well. And I will end, um, and I, again, if we were doing an hour and 15 minutes, I could do more on healing recovery. I don't need to do that because we have um, Dr. Stephanie Carnes here, and she will be talking about recovery. Uh, we have Clay Olson here. He's going to talk about connection, about love with his 
wonderful organization, Fight the New Drug. I encourage you to look it out. Pat Truman's going to talk to us about the legalities of it with his vast experience. Um, Pat and I were actually in Rome together um, when we were able to meet Pope Francis and to participate in that conference. And of course, uh, Gail Dines is going to tell us about the culture, ab about, about porn culture itself. And so I think, and then there's many other wonderful speakers that I don't know that I'm looking forward to hearing from as well. But this is kind of a general guide, and I'm going to go through some of this fairly quickly. My wife says, just don't go too fast. <laughs> so this is the brain. And I was a third year medical student, and uh, I was thinking about going and practicing ob -GYN with my dad. And one of the chief residents for neurosurgery lived down the street, and I went and watched them clip a brain aneurysm. And that was it. It was like, and I, I went after it, I said, I want to do this. And he said, you're a, a nice boy. Go do something, not, go do dermatology so you can sleep at night. And I was like, too late. And he went and talked to the neurosurgery chairman, Howard Eisenberg, and he said, he's got the disease. It's too late. He wants to do this madness. And so uh, I started doing the research and getting the letters, and Dr. Eisenberg ended up going to Maryland and running the Baltimore Shock Trauma Center there. And, uh, but I ended up going to Tennessee and training in neurosurgery and been practicing there for 25 years this year. And uh, started off private practice. I still do that, but I was asked by the chairman of neurosurgery there a few years ago to develop a training program for their University of Texas residents over um, at the, um, at our hospital. And then I was also asked to be the develop director of the Spinal Fellowship as well. So I do a lot of teaching of, of these bright young doctors. I have a fellow, I have a resident. I enjoy that part of, of teaching the next generation. So this is the brain. Quick lesson, okay. You can see over to your left, it's this frontal area, and then you have the back. Really quick neuroanatomy lesson. Frontal lobe, executive control center. Do it, don't do it, mm, think about it. Alka-Seltzer, I can't believe I ate that whole thing. You know, this is all this part of the brain. I really want to do that, but if I do, hmm, maybe there's going to be consequences of whatever the action is. And then back here, you see this brain stem. Let me see if this guy will work a little bit. Yeah, right here. Brain stem. This is the uh, midbrain. This is the pines, the medulla, all the way down to the cord. This midbrain produces a chemical called dopamine. Dopamine has many functions in the body, but one, it's, it's kind of an excitatory neurotransmitter. One of its functions is to drive desire. It powers the brain with desire. People think, well, it's a pleasure. Not really. It's more driving wanting. And there, there's other brain chemicals. There's the opioid systems and others that function in feeling good and satiation and that felt good. But driving desire, powering the brain with desire, that emanates out of this very phylogenetically primitive part of the brain called the brain stem, specifically the midbrain. And that's where dopamine sends brain wires to this area in here called the nucleus accumbens or the striatal region. It's, it's an a, a interconnected region that basically is the brain's reward system. It basically tells us to do things that feel good and they feel good because they help us survive. Now, again, you have the frontal area saying, Mm, think about it. It sends brain wires and back and forth to this reward center area in this area. So you have dopamine saying, just do it, reward center. You have this area saying, well, yeah, you can do it, but think about it. A chocolate cake every morning, you know, uh, yeah, has issues to worry about your weight. Um, you know, I, in other words, you weigh the, the pleasure. You evaluate, hmm, is this really going to be good for me in the end or not? So it's kind of a little bit of a tug of war. Um, between this, think about it, just do it, part of your brain, okay? That's simplistic. And I'm gonna come back to this, to the brain at the end. This area right here, that's called a ventral, that's a fluid area. And I'm gonna come back and talk at the end about a patient in this area right here at the end, just so you can remember that. Now, this is the porn industry's um, perspective perspective on whether pornography can be addictive. Uh, this is um, Steve Yakolovich. He uh, was the senior editor of XBiz at the time. And he said, you know, while much has been written 
uh, about pornography being addictive, um, you know, on par with blue-dry cigarettes. It's basically just questionable science. They're activists, these people. They're nutcases. Okay, don't believe them. Real science, non, and it, he, so he uses the word bias. Remember I started with that word, bias? Non-biased researchers say porn is, is fine. You know, drugs, booze, and cigarettes, they're really addictive because you can take them into your mouth. But, you know, things like gambling, like food, like sex, no, 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 you don't take them into your mouth so they can't really be addictive. Now, if I had more time, I would talk a little about how, guess what, our brain makes dopamine, our brain makes adrenaline. You know, adrenaline's a drug when patients uh, have cardiac arrest, we give them adrenaline. It's on the crash cart in all the hospitals. Yet our body makes adrenaline very well too. If you get flight or fight, flight or uh, fight or flight, your heart will beat. You feel this rush feeling. That's adrenaline. Is it a drug if our body makes it, but not a drug? Um, it, only a drug if we take it into our body, but not a drug if we make it ourselves. No, it's a drug either way. It's a brain drug. Well. So continuing then, he said, no one ever died from looking at porn. This is just a moral issue. And the pornography industry is absolutely desperate to keep this in the realms of religion. They want to make it moral. I'll talk more about that as we go along. And so you can be addicted to anything. He means in a kind of trite way. You know, food, eh, you can't be addicted to food. Actually, there's more money going into health issues for ob obesity with cholesterol, with strokes, heart attack than there is even drugs. It was like 80 billion a year a few years ago for obesity. So actually, yes, food is a problem, I would tell him, with addiction too. Let's not trivialize that, but. Now, this, that, that's the industry, the, the pornography industry saying that. Now, what about the porn, I call them apologists. They have an academic degree, so they use this academic veneer, although many of them, most of them don't have an academic title, an actual affiliation. This is uh, one, uh, Dr. Cord, who said, there is brain science and there's neuroscience, but none of that applies to sexual science. Wow, I, I can't comment on that. I can't even reason with that kind of attitude. With that, mm, uh, I'm, I'm gonna be kind here, but I, I don't know how to couch that in terms of a, a real discussion with this person that says that, well, all the pleasure in your brain, everything else in your brain is from your brain, but Sex, that's something magical. That's something your brain doesn't do, it just happens. And it's astounding to me that this, and this person is of course against the addiction label. And then this was in, in the paper uh, talking about this conference. Uh, this uh, uh, clinical psychologist, uh, uh, Cameron Staley said addiction is saying it's a biological cycle, compulsion saying it's an emotional cycle. Well, so in other words, if pornography is just a compulsion then it's just emotional, whatever that is. It's not really the brain. And again, to me, as a neurosurgeon, uh, that is, is, is not a valid statement, okay? It's not um, to, to say that, that we have these magic, it's almost magical. It's almost a quasi-religious statement, really, if you think about it, rather than science, to say sexuality is outside the realm of the brain. Of course it's not. <sighs> I'm gonna talk first about learning, and then we'll get into how that relates to studies about pornography. So this is a, a researcher that, we, we used to think the brain was ceramic, that by the time we grew out of early adulthood, that we took this plastic or clay brain and we molded it, and then we put it in the kiln and we fired it, it became ceramic and it didn't change anymore. We know now that is not true. As Norman Deutsch wrote in his book, The Brain That Changes Itself, we know the brain is plastic throughout life and changes, guess what, with learning. Learning molds and sculpts the brain. So Tori wrote this in Nature Neuroscience recently, the brain is the source of behavior, but in turn is modified by the behaviors it produces. Learning sculpts brain structure. This really goes back to the violin studies from 1995 where they looked at the brains of young, younger children and, and, and as they grew uh, who played the violin, they looked at the left side of the brain, the homunculus, or the area that controlled the hand, for the string hand, and lo and behold, it was on the opposite side of the hand, of course, lo and behold, the more the child and increasingly uh, older um, emerging adult practice, the, that area enlarged because of learning. And they're like, wow, so learning persists. It, it, the brain changes. Now, other studies have shown that. In 2007, 
uh, cortical asymmetries are the result. And these were longitudinal studies. This wasn't correlation. And there are some correlation studies we'll talk about, but this was causation. These were, this was causative. It's, it's caused as a result of use-dependent plasticity. And then Dragonsky in 2009 scanned medical students before and after a three-month period of intense studying and found that, yes, their brains enlarged uh, after the studying. Certain parts of their brain did. And in other words, the brain changes with learning. So what does that mean? Learning creates brain trails, physical changes in the brain, physical learning trails in the brain. This is good. Uh, and, and so neuroplasticity or plasticity is, is basically the ability of our brain to learn and to change. And it creates ruts or footprints. Dr. Mark Lewis wrote a book, Memoirs of an Addicted Brain, fascinating book. And he talks about the brain creating these brain trails or footprints. Now, just as there's good learning, there can also be aberrant learning. For instance, this learning, uh, uh, Cower and Malinka at Stanford University did a study and found that they looked at the way the synapses, the brain cells that talk to each other, changed with addiction. And they said addiction represents a pathological yet powerful form of learning and memory. That's it. That's it. That's, what, that's really what it is. Whether it's this poor patient I was taking care of with heroin a couple of weeks ago that had an infection from shooting heroin to their spine and they became paralyzed and I had to try to operate on them. So I, I treat addiction all the time in, in, my, in my world. Wonderful people that are desperate to stop and, and terrible things happen to them. And I face that all the time. People that become addicted to prescription drugs that I, I try to help and work with. So it's learning. It's aberrant learning. That's what it is. Is it a disease? I think so. As if most medical doctors call it a disease. Some may say, like Mark Lewis says, well, I don't think it's a disease. He's a PhD and I respect his work, but disease to him is something, you know, a germ or something that changes. But no, from a medical perspective, most physicians say, yeah, mental illness can, illness can be a disease too. And, and I believe this is a disease of learning of the reward system. Well, guess what? It, it, just as footprints develop with good learning, learning is pathological, as Cowan Malinka said. Guess what? Brain trails are created in our brain for aberrant learning, for learning with addiction. This pathological learning of addiction creates brain trails that are not helpful. And it's been seen with numerous substances like cocaine, methamphetamines, opiates, and also with natural addictions, these brain trails changing, like obesity. Now, that sexuality was an early study. That was actually a pedophile study, so I don't want to generalize that to everyone, but it still showed a sexual disorder that had associated brain changes. And then internet, that was out of China, the internet addiction. Was it gaming? They really didn't specify what the addiction was. And then pornography, and I'll talk about some, yes, recent porn studies showing brain changes. That study, the Kuhn study, was actually published in JAMA Psychiatry, I'll come back to it. Now, my interest in the neuroscience about, I was lecturing in Australia on, on um, neurosurgery oh, almost a decade ago, and while there, uh, this dear friend, Derek Denton, who started the Howard Florey Institute, it's a brain research institute that looks at instinctive brain craving, and while there, we were looking at, they look at what makes the brain instinctively crave something. In this case, sheep, a, a sheep model with salt craving is one of their best models. and. So they were saying, what brain chemicals, what DNA transcripts turn on and produce what brain chemicals with craving, natural craving? That's what they investigate. So while we were there, I said, have, have we looked, Derek, have, you, have we looked at addiction and compared this with DNA gene sets that are mobilized robustly with addictive behaviors and what brain chemicals are produced in that regard? And I said, mm, actually, we, they hadn't at that point. So he worked with Wolfgang Litsky and others at Duke University and Lo and behold, our study, it was a rodent study, and it showed that the same DNA transcripts that cause us to crave a natural craving, like salt, when we're depleted, these were it's an animal study, also caused, uh, this, they were the same DNA transcripts that caused drug craving. And so uh, in our paper, in other words, addiction genes, uh, that changes subserve genesis and gratification of a classic instinct, sodium appetite. We wrote in the paper, Dr. Licky did, that Basically, these DNA transcripts are usurped. These genes are usurped. And that's what happens with addiction. National Geographic wrote an article about our paper and said that cocaine addiction uses the same brain paths as salt cravings. Uh, drugs hijack. And I think that's what happens is these, these wonderful parts of our brain that help us feel pleasure to do things that help us can be hijacked. And they can be, instead of becoming a garnish to enjoy life, they can become the main event. 
And that's when addiction happens. And so I wrote this paper shortly thereafter, 2011, in um, uh, medical journals, uh, peer-reviewed journals, Surgical Neurology International. And based on that neuroscience, of the, I said, you know what, just as we see these brain changes with some natural addictions and drug addictions, I think we'll see it with pornography at some point. And so we predicted structural abnormalities and then also medica metabolic abnormalities. In other words, does the brain behave differently? Well, it does with cocaine, does it with porn? So we said, yes, we think it will. We predicted that. Obviously, there were those that didn't, and we predicted, we also called for a public health approach in our paper at that point. Now, of course, the other side didn't agree with us. No, you're saying that porn can change your brain, ha ha. It was the subject of a lot of jokes, uh, you know, r masturbating rats. I mean, all kinds of jokes came out of this, you know, making fun of our paper and our ideas. Uh, and so we wrote, that was the top one, neuroscience research fails to support claims. And then the second one, commentary on, um, we, we responded with that commentary. One of these authors that wrote, no way, it doesn't cause changes, wrote in, a, in another newspaper and said in another newspaper when they interviewed him that we have the best scanners, MRI scanners in the world at UCLA. I can promise you if we scan a pornography user's brain, you won't see any structural differences. Okay, and so that was back in 2010. Well, you know, maybe we have the best scanners in the U.S. at, at UCLA, but not in the world because guess what? At, at Germany, at Max Planck Institute, and later at Cambridge University with Valerie Voon's group, they found that, yes, structural changes were found with pornography. Did they, were they caused? We don't know. They were not longitudinal studies. They were snapshots, okay, to be fair. However, if pornography is a powerful form of learning, call it an addiction or whatever, if it doesn't cause these brain trails, it's probably the only learning activity that doesn't. So I suspect longitudinal studies will bear out just as they have in other, violin playing, for instance. And so this study, for instance, out of Germany showed that this reward area actually was smaller and the more hours per week of porn used, the smaller it became in people that were compulsively using pornography. Also in this study, the frontal area was disconnected functionally somewhat impaired from the reward center. So that judgment area, the braking system didn't work as well. The brake pads wore out, so to speak. And then this study came out of Cambridge confirming that same frontal issue of the brake pads wearing out. Two studies, structural studies. Now it did not show, this, this other British study did not show the same finding in the striatum or reward area. It did show an enlargement in the amygdala. Oh, well, that's good. Not necessarily. The amygdala can drive relapse, and, and certainly in drug addiction. So we don't know really what that means other than enlarged amygdalas may not always be good. But the bottom line is that both studies showed fr frontal changes. So then in Valerie Boone's group at Cambridge, they also looked at, at, at uh, metabolic changes. If you show a person with a cocaine addiction, a line of cocaine, and you scan their brain with functional MRI, with, uh, functional MRI um, their brain will light up because they're more cued to this addiction. So the question was, if you show a person that's not addicted to porn or compulsively using it, the same, you know, a, a cue for porn, will their brain light up like a cocaine person? So they did that, and yes, it did. And so in their study, they said, well, yeah, we think that there's a lot of similarities between addiction and problematic porn use or compulsive porn use. And then another study was published, a functional MRI study, um, again with Gola's group uh, out of Poland and Mark Potenza at Yale and others, and they confirmed that. They found functional studies that actually suggested it, and they said these findings suggest that problematic pornography use may represent a behavioral addiction, and that interventions helpful to targeting behavioral and substance addictions warrant consideration for adaptation and helping men deal with problematic pornography addiction. A second study published in PLUS One out of, um, uh, of several places, uh, Dr. Poten uh, Dr. Voon's on this one as well, Dr. Potenza at Yale, Dr. Voon at Cambridge, um, confirmed that metabolic finding, and they said these studies together provide support for an incentive motivation theory of addiction underlying the aberrant responses towards sexual cues and compulsive sexual behaviors. So, these are prominent institutions. I don't think anyone can argue they're coming at this from a religious perspective at all. Um, so, in fact, in the Lancet Psychiatry, Dr. Voon, Potenza, and Gola, and um, Corin Krauss said that we believe the classification of compulsive sexual behavior disorder as an addictive disorder is consistent 
with recent data that might benefit clinicians, researchers, and individuals suffering from and personally affected by this disorder. So they're saying in the upcoming ICD-11, which hadn't been released at that time, we all, Cambridge, Yale, all these, think that it should be in the addictive category. Now, the controversy, and I'll go into this, was in the DSM-5, gambling was accepted as an addiction, but not before it was first put in the DSM-5 as an impulse control disorder. So they did impulse control disorder, then they did natural, a behavioral addiction with gambling. So the ICD-11 may be following the same path. They said for the first time that yes, and, and by the way, they, they did come out and, and, and make it an impulse, impulse control disorder. For the first time, it is a disorder. This study was published, it was in the uh, Israel, it was held in Israel. It was the 21st World Meeting on Sexual Medicine, again by Dr. Um, Gola and Potenza at Yale and several others. And they found that the gambling data was pretty close, uh, or, sorry, the pornography data for problematic pornography use was pretty much as robust as, at least, as the gambling data, which was a well-known accepted behavioral addiction. And so there's, and Dr. Potenza was instrumental at, at Yale in placing and having gambling placed as a natural behavioral addiction in the DSM-5. And by the way, the pornography apology apologists don't question gambling at all. And so now, of course, for the first time, uh, compulsive pornography use is a mental health disorder. It's a impulse control disorder. It's classified. It's actually an addiction, and it will be called such at some point. I'm, I'm, just as we predicted in 2011 there would be structural changes, write it down, okay? I'm saying it right now. It will be classified as a behavioral addiction. It's going to happen. It's just basically the other side is fighting that label for obvious reasons. Now, I just want to say one word, and I'm going to talk a little bit about bias because the science is here. And you say, well, what's the question? Because people that are, I'd say, pro-pornography and have a cozy cultural relationship with the industry, they don't like this addiction label. Now, for instance, and, and you'll see that coming out in the press. Now, in talking about named individuals, I want to make it clear that I have no personal animosity or say nothing denigrating about individuals that I discuss. I'm simply talking about what they write and how they represent themselves on this issue. Just so we know, I have no ill, feeling, Ill will towards any of them. Now, if you read, for instance, the Spokesman Review article for this conference, you'll see that this conference is, they say, a conference about pornography. They call us, those of us that are here, activists, kind of anti-porn activists. I'm called a Mormon neurosurgeon who wrote a book for the Mormon church. I did 10 years ago. I wrote it 10 years ago. And you know, a lot of people in that community feel that it helped them. Now, I do a lot of other things. As, I, as was mentioned, I was, met Pope Francis at the Vatican. But most of the work I do is not religious. I speak to every semester now to the graduate addiction course at UT about addiction. And there's people from all sexual backgrounds they're gay, they're bisexuals, they're heterosexuals. I don't care and they don't care. And they are glad to have me come talk openly about these issues. And all of these people are friends of mine. And I don't care. I, I, I think there's this labeling thing that says if there's religion involved or even a perspective, there's bias. And so what I challenge them to do is leave religion out of this in this public health setting. Uh, do morality on your own time is what I would say. But here, can we talk about this from a public health perspective and leave religion out of it. They don't seem to be able to. For instance, in the newspaper for this conference, it was mentioned that I wrote a religious book. Again, I just asked my wife, when did I write that book? She said, 2009, she just emailed her, I'd forgotten, it was de a decade ago. But this book wasn't mentioned. My academic credentials were not mentioned, even though one of the, the, the uh, people, Dr. Prowse, who at the end of the, of the article, you ought to read the article, it says, Actually, don't listen to anything they say they're not scientists. You know, listen to me. And yet, it says Dr. Prowse is a neuroscientist who used to be at UCLA. Well, she's not at UCLA now. She has no academic credentials that I know of. I do, but mine weren't mentioned. And it wasn't mentioned that I wrote a chapter with Dr. Carnes, who you'll hear from, in this book. It's uh, by Oxford University Press, The Neurobiology of Addiction. It was edited by Dr. Swan, Lipke, and others at the Leninger Institute at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. 
um, published again by Oxford University Press as a psychiatric textbook to train new doctors in psychiatry. Uh, Dr. Patenz at Yale endorsed it uh, and said, you know, it tells us uh, about new avenues like sex addiction and what does the science say? So I would just ask that that's the bias that we see sometimes in reporting is that if you are, quote, talking, uh, saying anything but the party line about it's party time with porn, guys, if you say anything else, like, well, there's actually reputable scientists around the world saying, hey, there's some evidence of this being an addiction, and there's people writing this, then why don't they mention this more recent book instead of just a religious book that I wrote 10 years ago? So you see my point on the bias. We'll talk about that just a little bit more as we go. American Society of Addiction Medicine, these are medical doctors board certified in addiction. So they treat addiction, they, they can actually prescribe medication and drugs for addiction withdrawal. Um, and so they've defined addiction in 2011 as chronic disease of the brain affecting reward, motivation, and memory, and particularly, guess what? Addiction isn't just drugs, it's also behaviors, powerful behaviors, food, sex, gambling, can be real brain addictions and change the brain the same way, which you probably wouldn't argue with me now that you've seen the other science that I showed you. But ASAM has said this, and yet the pro-porn apologists will ignore ASAM. Guess what, the DSM, and they say, well, the DSM-5 doesn't have it. It has gambling, but not pornography. Well, the DSM-5 is not a biology book. It's only a manual for clinicians to diagnose and treat individuals based on interview and observation in the field. It's a theoretical. It says, we're not saying whether what this is coming from, whether it's a brain addiction or not, or, or a mental illness of any kind or not. It covers all mental illness. It doesn't describe etiology or biology, only behavior. And that's, and, the ridiculousness of this is found in this assumption. So, in other words, I kid you not, these porn apologists will say, a guy can be on online all night, clicking online poker, misses his job, doesn't get up in the morning, you know, difficulties all in, in every area of his life because he can't stop clicking online poker. That's an addiction. No problem, no problem. The porn apologists say, that's fine, that's an addiction. His twin brothers in the next room, identical twins, same DNA, same thing, clicking all night, same results, losing relationships, can't go to work, can't get up in the morning, gets arrested at work for using a company computer with porn. That's not an addiction. And that's ludicrous. And yes, this will move from impulse control to addiction, it, it has to. I mean, so can you see the bias? I, I, I think it's fairly obvious. And that's why the DSM was slammed after the DSM-5 came out by Scientific American and others who, you notice the headline on this one, addicted to fat overeating may alter the brain as much as hard drugs. Well, the DSM's fundamental flaw, it says nothing about the biological underpinnings of mental disorders. So, yeah, they, they make a big deal about the DSM, the ICD, it's not an addiction. No, that's not the whole story. Who was Nicholas Tinberg? And he won the Nobel Prize in 1972. He painted fake plaster bird eggs, bigger and brighter than the birds' regular eggs. And guess what? The birds would look at their eggs, these big, pretty eggs, and go, eh, I think I'll try to hatch the big, pretty ones. It was called a supranormal stimulus, a stimulus above what they encountered in their natural evolutionary niche. Then he did an interesting experiment. He did butterflies. And he took this butterfly species where the male chooses the female based on the color and shape of her wings and mates with her. And he painted these cardboard artificial butterfly wings bigger and brighter than the normal female. Then he gave the males access to both and guess what? The males ignored the real females. He had real female butterflies right there to mate with, ignored them and tried to mount and mate these cardboard females. And they were looking at these butterflies, what stupid butterflies? Is it so different, really, today? I told this story in a documentary uh, a while ago, and the whole documentary was named after the cardboard story. It's, it's called Addicted to Porn, Chasing the Cardboard Butterfly. And I, I think the premise of it is that, yes, this can be an addiction. They did inter interview David Lay as well. They did both sides. But yeah, it's, it's a super normal stimulus. And what's happening now is it's going to become more potent with Oculus headsets because it's 3D. And now with two cameras, sex acts are filmed and the person isn't watching the female performer increasingly. And it, yeah, there's porn back and forth. This is mainly 
male to female porn and female to female. So what they do then is they film it to where in the Oculus set, there's no male. You look down and don't see your feet, it's just you. And the female performer comes up and has sexual relations with you. And so this is called VR porn, virtual reality porn. And there's a lot of people in the porn side that are excited. They say, this is gonna, this is gonna make regular porn obsolete, as uh, Alex Helmy said. It's gonna make 2D porn obsolete. We might, the other guy, we may not even need females anymore. Well, I, I call that extinction. <laughs> if we were worms, we'd be worried. <laughs> you know, so pornography driving virtual reality, yeah. Yeah, Facebook bought Oculus, right? And they say it's not for porn, but guess what? There were, they were at this uh, Vegas convention where they were marketing it. And as this guy on the bottom says, behind the scenes, you have to say this is gonna be the driver. And of course, porn's gonna drive Oculus. And of course, Pornhub, I'll go into who they are, but Pornhub um, gave away a, a lot. I don't remember how many headsets, these cheap headsets, just to help people. And they're actually producing VR content. MindGeek is. We'll talk about who MindGeek is in a moment. And this is really uh, out of the Orient in Japan, but there's no nudity here, but this is a guy wearing a masturbation suit. It's attached to his genitals. He's in VR porn. And so the females were filmed tactically, you know, like Anthony, um, Lord of the Rings with Anthony, or uh, Anthony Circus, who played Gollum, you know, moving around. My son can imitate Gollum, you know, it's, it's this, you know, you've ever seen Lord of the Rings, right? Well, he was filmed tactically. So he's moving around, the actor is, and then they make him a this computer weird looking creature. That's what they do with the female performers. They haptically film them with haptic devices on them and then marry to them the site which moves sexually with them. So the guy's having sex with them and it's physically the sensation as if he's there. And that little butterfly I put on there just to kind of make that cardboard butterfly link. It's really the same, isn't it? And in Japan where this has really gone to the next level, con condoms are falling primarily because a lot of them aren't having sex. A lot of these Japanese young men are just staying in their, in their apartments, having sex with technology. I like this statement from um, Naomi Wolf, who was in New York uh, Magazine. She said, um, for the first time in human history, the image's power and allure have supplanted that of real naked women. Today, real naked women are just bad porn. That's the supernormal stimulus. Now, let's talk about apologism a little bit the tobacco professors and the what I call porn apologists or professors. Look, in 1900, TB was the number one cause of death. So people didn't live long enough to die of lung cancer, really. Uh, and so it was all a tool of the devil. It was a, a religious issue. Tobacco was a religious issue 100 years ago. It was a tool of the devil, as this thing says. So if you say, I don't like tobacco, yeah, get your, take, keep your own morals, man. It helps my cold. <clears throat> I feel better, you know. And so and, and, and that apologism continued to today. This was in 94 when the Tobacco 7 stood up in front of uh, Representative Waxman's committee. Remember that? And all said, tobacco is not addictive. Today, they're probably the only seven people in the world that would say that, right? These representatives of the seven tobacco companies. With a straight face. But I'm afraid my profession didn't do so well either. This is back in the 50s. And, uh, you know, more doctors smoke camels. And this other guy's a throat surgeon. Give your throat a vacation, he says. Ugh. <laughs> I know, it's really sad, a really long vacation. Like, so, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, we're complicit, but they use that. The tobacco industry used the, this, this alliance with the tobacco scientific apologists to create this collusion, this illusion and collusion of, of respectability, of credibility. And Clarence Little was former president of the University of Michigan. He was a Harvard-educated uh, cancer researcher. And he said, tobacco smoke is harmless. He said that until... Seven, in the 70s when he died. And he said, tobacco is harmless. Cover of Time Magazine, smoking. Tobacco Research Council, a group of physicians and PhDs that got together to sh prove that tobacco is harmless. And they worked with Hill and Knowlton, the PR firm for the tobacco industry. So I'm, I'm talking about this because we're gonna see and similarity in the playbook here. So warning, uh, this is 1970 or 64 when the, the label goes, 65 when the label goes on. Well, guess what? This was a memo from Hill and Knowlton, the PR firm, to these scientists, a secret memo saying, what do we need to do, man? There's these, they're, and this is after the label was put on. And they're saying, they're putting labels on cigarettes. Come on, you doctors. Did they say, ooh, it's harmful. We need to stop smoking. No, they said, the, they listened to these people who were the public relations firm who said, 
The most important story is that which casts doubt on the cause and effect theory of disease and smoking. Thus, headline should strongly call out the point, controversy, other factors, unknowns. And we, if you'll notice in the newspaper article for this conference, are controversial. Not Dr. Voon, uh, I mean, not uh, the Dr. Prowse and Dr. Lay who say porn's fine, but we here, Dr. Voon, Dr. Potenza, all the others are controversial because we believe that there is evidence supporting an addictive model for pornography. What about the industry side? Anyone heard of MindGeek in the room? Sorry, it's one of the largest monopolies in the world. Owns 90 plus percent of all internet sites. More bandwidth than Amazon and Netflix at certain times. They own Pornhub, YouPorn. I mean, they're one of the largest companies in the world. Go read this article by David Auerbach in Slate Magazine. There is a porn monopoly, his name is MindGeek. Take a picture, go read that article. It's a huge industry. And as they point out, if it was anything but porn, the FTC would be all over them for trade uh, violation, but porn gets a pass. So this is a big industry colluding with academic apologists. And again, kind of going back and the tobacco thing, no, we're not targeting kids, the tobacco industry said. Remember that? Notice how young that Joe Camel's little adolescent looks there with him, a little kind of young camel there. And sure enough, secret memos came out. Go read Harold Brandt's, or, uh, Brandt's book, The Cigarette Century, and Klugman's book, Ashes to Ashes, about the tobacco con collusions and conspiracies. They said, basically, these are secret memos from the tobacco, and these helped do the big tobacco suit. Everyone starts smoking. They choose a brand before they're like 18 years old. We got to, alluding to, we got to get them early. Do they choose Pornhub when they're 18, before they're 18? Do we need to get them early as well? Well, that's why this is an article published. You'll notice David Lay, Nicole Prowse, um, and um, David Finn. And basically they said one possibility is those with higher sexual sensation seeking pornography use pornography at younger ages to broaden their context. They're saying we need younger it's this push by the industry and whether tobacco or porn and its apologists to say younger and younger. Now, this is an article, for instance, from the Daily Beast kind of saying, look, porn addiction isn't real. What did she use? She used this study here by um, Nicole Prowse that was an EEG study that showed really habituation. It showed um, changes in EEG that really went more with habituation, but she interpreted it as addiction because it suited, I think, her narrative. Um, interestingly, so this, this paper came out, and then I wrote a rebuttal to it in the same journal, uh, High Desire Merely an Addiction, and then we also wrote uh, Raj uh, Naran, um, Hajula of ASAM and Bonnie Phillips and myself wrote this uh, in another journal, the bottom uh, paper here, right here. Again, uh, contesting what, what she said there. This study that she wrote, this Steele, Staley, Prout, Fong, Prowse study, was published the same week that I had, by total chance, published a paper in the same journal. It came about a week later on the supernormal stimulus thing I just talked about, right? And interestingly, and then I published remember, that rebuttal as well, this, Dr. John Johnson, uh, Johns Hopkins PhD, who is a professor at Penn State, wrote this in my paper as well. Uh, he participated with me in the paper and said, it says nothing about addiction and there's no control groups. So, I mean, others agreed with me and there's been several other papers taking the study down. And this is what's interesting. I'm not doing this self-promotion. I'm just saying, so this was several years ago. Now, if I just went on yesterday and clicked in the history of the journal, Socioeffective Neuroscience, what are the top viewed papers in the history of the journal? My paper is actually number one right here at the top. It's 6,600 views. Nicole Prowse comes in here. So it's, it's you know, up, up there, I mean, in a journal. Um, six, 1606 views, so I have like six times more views in this journal. But yet it didn't make the Daily Beast, <laughs> right? I'm just, remember, a religious fanatic, <laughs> okay. Um, now, the reason I show this picture, um, this was actually on, on this person, uh, Dr. Prowse's uh, promotion page. So I'm not showing anything she wouldn't want showed. She, and, and so again, I'm, I'm being respectful here. I don't want you to think, but I'm, I'm doing, this is what she showed. She wants to be promoted in, in this line. So this is the um, X-rated uh, Critics Organization Award, a, um, XRCO Awards. And she's on the red carpet with producers and performers. 
And then AVN is the other Academy Awards, and uh, Melissa Hill, a producer, said, look, um, over here, said Jenny's story, Mel uh, Dr. Prowse wrote to Melissa Hill on Twitter and said, I heard at AVN was amazing, I'll refrain. Now recently someone had contested that and it told me, Dr. Prowse told me that she didn't go to AVN. I'm like, well maybe she didn't, but I, what do I do with that? Now, why do I show this? And let me show a couple of other ones and then I'll come back as to why this is important. Pornhub, owned by MindGeek, this huge company. On the net neutrality issue, she said, concerned about net neutrality, good guy Pornhub and YouPorn, both of them are owned by MindGeek. Huge company, it'd be like Philip Morris. It'd be like a researcher saying tobacco's harmless and then going to the uh, national uh, banquet for the uh, Philip Morris and hanging out with the executives. And oh, by the way, I said tobacco's harmless. Hey guys, you know, it, is there bias there? And so that's my only point is that, look, if I'm biased, can the other side be biased? And if so, if we do a newspaper article, can we at least say that, that there could be bias on both sides? Is that fair? That's, I think, what I would ask. This is a book, sorry about this, this is my only slang I'm gonna do. I don't do slangs and I don't do images, but I have to do this slang because David Lay, who was on that paper, remember, said he wrote this, this book about how males can better pleasure themselves with porn. And so I'm like, uh, you know, and look who it's endorsed by. David's Lay's voice brings nuance to most important conversations. Pornhub, MindGeek. It's this cozy cultural collaboration with the porn apologists in the industry. Are they funded by them? I have no idea. Not talking about funding or, I'm just saying the optics are pretty direct, wouldn't you think? Now religion. Others publish and say that, you know, it's all a religious issue. Um, and this study was really interesting because they use the word perceived addiction. We perceive that it's addiction. In other words, it's not really addiction. It's perceived addiction. Well, any addiction, whether it's cocaine or whatever, is a defect in perception. So this is the most ridiculous idea. And yet these folks will try to imply that it's just a moral issue. What about NOFAP? It's a community of several hundred thousand or a couple hundred thousand now. I think it's 200,000. It's bigger now. 62% of these are atheist agnostic and they're online trying to stop porn. What does that tell us? That it's religious? So you don't hear that in, in a quick blurb, you know, you don't hear all this. Porn today, it's vaginal, oral, uh, anal penetration, frequently the male ejaculate. This is from Dr. Dines who's with us today, he's done a lot of work on this. Um, Anna Bridges, there's some, a lot of people that have, have exposed the content on this. Um, and frequently facial ejaculation on the female's face. And my question is they say we're sex negative for not liking porn. How is that sex positive for the woman or even for the man, but particularly for the woman to have facial ejaculation in her face, which is very typical common ending for most porn. And that's why, you know, what are male attitudes that drive this? Because it has to be male driven, right? Uh, what are neuro, uh, mirror neurons? Uh, years ago, a monkey was eating peanuts and they noticed that the same areas of the monkey's brain fired when the monkey was eating the peanuts is another monkey that was watching a monkey eat the peanuts. So they called it mirror neurons. And you know, there is some utility with mirror neurons. There was a study done on mirror neurons in pornography in France that found that individuals watching pornography resonate with the motivational state of other individuals appearing in visual depictions of sexual interactions. So mirror neurons are powerful. What is the motivational state? What do males in pornography say? What do they think? Bill Margold, and again, I, think I got this from Gail Dine's book. I'd really like to show what I believe the men want to see, violence against women. I firmly believe we serve a purpose by showing that. The most violent we can get is ejaculation in the face. And men get off on that because they get even with the women they can't have. We try to inundate the world with orgasms in the face. So this is a very prominent male spokesman for the industry. Now, John Stagliano said, I was the first to shoot Rocco. Together we evolved into rougher stuff. Started to spit on girls, strong male dominant thing. Being girls being pushed to their limit. Looked like violence, but it's not. I mean, pleasure and pain are the same thing, right? Of course it's not. Um, now, this is a study that was published in Porn Studies. It's a academic journal that is pro-porn. And they honored him as being an innovator, John Stagliani. This guy was honored in this porn studies journal as being an innovator. Notice who else publishes in this journal. This is David Lay saying the pseudoscience behind the public health crisis legislation. So I'm just saying it's kind of a cozy relationship if you really are honest. 
Other male perspectives are 19, they're hookers, they don't care, they're throwaway commodities. Uh, James Dean is supposed to be the feminist male porn guy. I'm not gonna take time to read these, I can give you this slides later, but basically he doesn't treat women well. Joanna Angel said, this is a person who said to me, girls in porn are, are holes for me to put my sexual organ in. So th these are male perspectives in porn, and 90% of the titles show aggression, name, pull, uh, name calling, hair slapping. They are aggression. And naked, the, this, you ought to read this study, it's Naked Aggression, it's out of uh, New York University, Chen Sun's work. None of this is religious, this is secular stuff here, but it's about the, the male marking behavior and the fact that most women didn't want it, but the male knew they didn't want it and they still wanted to do it. They watched porn and then wanted to ejaculate on their girlfriend's face. Sexual scripting. Um, cadavering, I've gotta do this one. Um, I'm gonna start wrapping up here, but I've got a couple of things, I, you, you probably wanna hear this. Uh, study done in the past, they took a rat, they put a piece of wood with cadaverine on it. Cadaverine is what makes dead things stink. It's horrible. Even rats hate it. The ran, male rat ran to the other side of the cage. Then they impregnated a female, receptive female's coat with cadaverine, put her in the cage. The male rat kind of, ugh, mm. Sexual desire overcame it. He mates with her eventually because of the sexual desire. Finally, every time he mates, it's a cadaverine female. Then, guess what they did at first? Took the same rat no female, put a piece of wood with cadaverine, just like the first, what did he do? Did he run? Nope, he went and started chewing on the wood. So the authors of this journal said that an, an aversive thing can become nice. We like it because we pair it with a sexual reward. We teach our brain to like it. And really what we're doing is we're scripting, aren't we? It's like Huxley said in the second edition of Brave New World 47, that it's a really efficient totalitarian state we want in which the all-powerful executive of political bosses and their army of managers control a population of slaves who do not have to be coerced because they love their servitude. And loving that servitude is what pornography wants to teach the women of the world to do and the men of the world to, um, to do as well. So I'm not gonna read these. These are basically tough and, and Gail, it will probably cover at least some of this. I hope just a little of it to, it's horrible, it's dark, but it's, People think, well, part isn't that bad. And I took a beating, it was great. It's, these are women saying how horrible it was. And it, it, if you read this, Diane Sawyer's investigation, you're like, are we really liking this as a culture? One producer said, I have to be in my other half to do porn. I, I put my brain in the other, we call that dissociations in psychology, right? So, and the directors chew them up, spit them real fast. They don't last more than a year or two, these 18, 19 year old girls, and they're out. Is that really, is that exploitation or not? I think it is. This is a study where, of course, I think the porn apologists would say that's all anecdotal. This is a really good study on, a peer reviewed study in the Journal of Urban Health that details, no, there's no consent. Yes, this does happen. Yes, it's bad. I really like the one where they say, oh, no condoms because you know, we test for HIV. Well, there's still transmissions of HIV, um, and OSHA says to use it even in California, and they ignore it. Two peer-reviewed studies, this is an infected actress that said they don't care about us. She got HIV on set. Now, this is a peer-reviewed study that said use condoms. What are they doing, porn industry? Of course you wanna use condoms. These are medical doctors. Here's another one published in the uh, Dermatologic Virenerology. Use condoms, of course. These are what doctors say. These are what peer-reviewed science says. What does Dr. Prowse say? No, don't use condoms. How is that scientific? How is that medically defensible? Oh, chlamydia and gonorrhea. You can take a pill. You can take a pill, they say. Oh, we create super gonorrhea. That's really bright. Chlamydia, micro-scarring in the fallopian tubes. Leaves them infertile. I don't think they really care. I don't think Steve Hirsch cares, the president of Vivid, porn group uh, organization Vivid or company, will fight for our right to express ourselves as we please. No condoms, he says. But would he want his daughter Alexa, this is an LA Times article, to be a Vivid star? He smiles, leans back in his overstuffed leather chair. I'd tell her to really think that through. I would respect whatever decision she would make, and then I would send her to medical school, not put her on my set. Jenna Jameson, arguably one of the top female performer names. Anderson Cooper, what if your daughter wanted to do this, Jenna? I'd tie her in a closet. Not something any parent wanted to choose for their child. Hey, my child, hey, I'd want them to go to college and be a doctor. It's interesting they pick on doctors both times. <clears throat> now, 
wrapping up, about five minutes and I'll be finished there. So uh, I had the opportunity, as was mentioned, to go to the Vatican. We had a private audi audience with Pope Francis and he said to us in this private audience, we would be seriously deluding ourselves were we to think that a society where an abnormal consumption of internet sex is rampant among adults could be capable of effectively protecting minors. He's absolutely correct on that. And this woman whose husband had struggled with porn and, and she, he, he continued to do so, said basically what really happened to him is a layer of empathy had been ground away. It makes sense, doesn't it? It's like Robert Jensen, he's a journalist and professor at UT Austin said, that what does it say about our culture that cruelty is so easy to market? We accept that a culture flooded with images of women who are sexual commodities increasingly Women in pornography are not people having sex, but bodies about when sexual activities and increasing cruelty are playing out. And many men, maybe a majority, like it. I, and, and this is kind of the wind up, four, four minutes, I'll be, I'll be done, Alison. Getting close to finished here. So Cicero, 2,000 years, I love this quote. He said, yet more, if emotion be eliminated, what difference is there, I say, not between a man and a brute, but between a man and a rock or the trunk of a tree or any inanimate object. And I believe Cicero, I think really it's about connection and it's about emotion. That's what we are. That's who we are. I spoke at Des Moines at a medical school there a few years, osteopathic school a few years ago. And they told this story. Patricia and Alan Neely were in a boat on the Des Moines River. The boat went over the falls. Alan gave Patricia the only life jacket she was swirling in the water, holding the life jacket. Alan drowned. She was about to drown. A horrified group of onlookers tried to rescue her. They got all the rescue crews. They couldn't do it. Jason Oglesby wasn't a rescue worker. He was a construction worker. They were building a building, but they had a crane. And as you can see, he hooked the crane around himself and lowered himself into the water and pulled Patricia out of that water and saved her life. And you can see why Mary Chine, who took that photograph, won the Pulitzer Prize for it. I actually saw that. Pat, we were in, in D.C. at uh, the National Press Club for one of those press conferences, and that was on the wall in the National Press Club when I was in D.C. with Pat here. I, I reject the view that men are brainless brutes and that women are pieces of meat. No, I think we're all humans. I think we're designed to, yes, to think, to create, but also to love and to care and to connect. And I'll finish back where I started. So years ago, I was in my office and a fellow physician came in with a scan. It had actually a little tumor, a benign tumor, sitting right there, blocking this fluid structure. And he, he said they got a new CAT scan in their office and he tried it out to be the guinea pig. Don't do that. <laughs> so he brings this scan and he's like, I've got this colloid cyst in my brain. Is it okay? And I'm like, no, it's not. It can cause sudden death. So instead of him going to, he had tickets to the final four. He was a big Texas fan. This was years ago when they were playing in the final four in New Orleans. He had to cancel it. So instead I was operating on my friend. I split the two halves of the brain, went through the corpus callosum and removed this cyst. But interestingly, because I knew him, he was a fellow physician, I was looking at the fornix and, and these structures that carry memory for half the brain, that I could see the striatum, reward center right there, third grade right there, no, but, but that's him, that's my friend, he's there, that's his emotion, and it was a bit of an epiphany, that, that, this guy that I know, that's what I know, it's right here, and it was a little bit of a, an epiphany about who who he was and who I am and who you are and who we all are and what we are. And, and I think, I, my wife recently talked to another woman that she met at a church event that I had operated on 23 years ago with the same surgery. I'd forgotten this. And she's now in her 80s, she's a widow and she's a good friend of my wife's and they put it together. She went, your name, and it was 23 years ago, I did the same surgery on her. I was worried about her memory for about two months after she had, and she's normal now. I was so grateful to that. I reject the voices of anger. I believe we can do better. I believe we can find peace as a society and culture and that we can heal from this societal problem that we all face. Thank you.